Hi, welcome to the Diablo Podcast. We are online at DiabloPodcast.com. I am the host, Flux, and on this show I am joined by my guest, David Craddock. Hey, great to be here. And who are you and why are you famous? I am, I am nobody. <laughs> I'll put the pressure on you to explain things. <laughs> I, I, am, I am not famous, but... Uh, not yet. Not yet, not yet, but if you uh, stay well and listen, I'll tell you how I might be. Um, I am an mm-hmm. author who uh, loves Diablo... In fact, my first exposure to Blizzard, more on the Blizzard North side, was through playing Diablo, and uh, it struck me as kind of a sin, pun not intended, that no one had told this story in its entirety, so I decided to just start looking people up and contacting, and uh, about three years later, here we are. And this story is the story of Blizzard North? The story of Blizzard North, the making of the, the first two Diablo games, and everything in between. And everything out, because there was a lot after the second Diablo game. That's where the the drama really began. Yes, yes, everything after two, all all the way through, um, you know, from the studio's beginning as Condor in 1993, through its closure in 2005. And you have, this is kind of an oral history. You've spoken to many, many people who were involved. I have. I've spoken to over 65 developers, um, tons of Blizzard North guys, obviously. Um, and also several uh, former developers from, or developers formerly from, from Blizzard Entertainment, I should say. And you said you are an author. You have done other published works. This isn't your first book ever. Uh, this is actually, it'll be, well, I've got some other things in the works right now, so I'm not sure what number book it'll be. But in 2008, I published a, another nonfiction book on renewable energy. I've published um, some uh, short stories in mostly fantasy, and uh, I'm working on some other novels right now, and some other uh, video game industry history books in addition to this one, actually. And you're currently an employee in the video game industry as well? I was a freelance journalist slash creative writer for a while. Uh, I still take freelance assignments on occasion, but I've kind of stepped back, mostly because the scope of this project has eaten up most of my time. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. It's been great to work on it, but I still do. I'm a, I'm a writer by trade, so I write in the games industry whenever projects come up, and I also tackle other assignments as well. And after I take time to breathe, I'm always working on a project of my own here and there. So you said this whole thing got started three years ago, which would be... Um, I was, I was a, that was after Diablo 3 was officially announced? It was actually... If I think back, it was a little bit before... It's kind of it's starting to run together. I think it was actually near the end of 2007. Um, I met Eric Sexton and Kelly Johnson, um, designers and artists on the game on Diablo and Diablo 2, when I was working on a freelance assignment uh, writing about 3D stereoscopic graphics for official Xbox magazine. And uh, Eric and I actually struck up a friendship, and I thought, well, wow, this is so cool. I'm actually becoming friends with one of the guys who, who worked on my two favorite computer games, and then I kind of had a, a eureka slash, well, duh moment. I thought, well, maybe if I can get a hold of others, they'd be interested in working on a book. And Eric, he was actually the first guy I interviewed. He thought it was a really cool idea. He helped me get in touch with a ton of other people, and things have kind of um, started rolling from there. That was, the, that was the planting of the seed for the idea, and I didn't really start the interviews and the heavy research until 2008. Um, Research began before Diablo 3 was announced, and the interviews began a little bit after that. I was going to ask how you got started on this, because it's, it's hard to get... You know, I've, I know a few of the other of the former Blizzard North people, and it's easy to talk to one person, but then it's hard to find emails and contacts. And as you say, it was good you got in with Eric Sexton and Kelly Johnson. Yeah, and you know, it's actually it's kind of funny... Um, I met them through my freelance writing, and then they actually liked my stuff. They appreciated it. So when they... When they were working uh, for a development studio called L5 Games uh, in the Bay Area, they actually contacted me to do some writing for a game they were working on. That fell through, and their next venture, they worked at a company called Red Bana, which actually picked up the Hellgate Ball. And I actually, I don't know if anyone will ever play it, but I actually rewrote all of Hellgate from beginning to end. Um, worked on that with uh, Eric, Kelly, Michio, John Morn a lot of other ex-Blizzard North guys, and they, in turn, helped me get in touch with even more guys. I started talking with, of course, Dave Brevik, Max and Eric Schaefer, Rick Cease, 
uh, John Gasco, Phil Schenk, you know, people all over the place. So it really started to snowball once I started spreading the idea around that I wanted to write this book. So I, I'm curious about the Hellgate thing. It, the, you wrote what's, you know, the current ongoing version of Hellgate. You rewrote a lot of the plot or did that not make it into the game? I, I rewrote the whole thing and it was, I got my first taste of how uh, the other side of the video game industry works, the non-journalistic side. I rewrote the script for the entire game from the end of 2008 through mid-2009, around April or so. Um, and then when I was done, our parent company said, thank you very much, we no longer need a writer. And I was laid off. <laughs> Um, and so, Do you know if they kept any of your work in the game, though? I, I don't know. I don't know whatever happened. We were we were uh, working on um, the 1.5 patch, and I know it was supposed to hit the Asia Pacific territories first. And I don't know if it'll ever get a stateside release. In fact, they were also, even if it does come here, I'm not sure how much of my work will have survived because they were doing this funky thing where they would take my English script, translate it into various languages. And then translate it back to English, and there were all sorts of errors and things I was trying to help them weed out. So if my work does survive, and it's completely terrible due to that, it's not my work anymore. I'll have to step back. <laughs> if only you'd written written in, in English in the first place. They could have just used that. Yeah, but wait. That, that was the whole thing. That's exactly what happened. And they decided, no, 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 let's, let's translate it back in time and, and see if we can muddy it up a little bit. So who knows what happened to that. That, that's funny. That's actually like the joke people make when you see like a really poorly written instruction manual or something. And it's yeah. Like, and, and they and use Google to translate this into Chinese and then back to <laughs> English. Yes, actually they did. Yes, that is what happened. True story. The, real, the really odd part about that is I was finishing up my college degree in early 07, and I did extensive interviews with many people at Hellgate London about storytelling and video games, and especially including Ivan Sulek, who actually wrote almost all of the Hellgate London dialogue and plot and story. It's such a small world. I mean, the fact that I actually got to not only interview people from my favorite game studio, but actually work with them on projects, it was it was kind of very surreal. And the tragic part is that I, I kind of formed my senior project was this paper about kind of like the, the difficulties of doing story and how, you know, this one writer in the entire company and everyone else is just doing the programming and the art. And then they fire you as soon as the project's done, which you can yep. certainly testify to. <laughs> Yeah, it, and, a, it's, and Ivan had never written a game before. He had been in game review and design. He started off as the community manager at the company and kind of worked his way up. And his whole thing was, I don't care if people think it's good. I just don't, don't want to be blamed for the failure of the project. <laughs> and then, of course, the project failed. And right. a lot of the complaints were about how, how wacky the writing was. It was kind of the worst of all scenarios. But luckily, you fixed all that up. Uh, hopefully. Again, if, 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 they, if they muddied up my uh, script, then I did not <clears throat> write the script. If you That's a convenient there. excuse you have there. I'd, I'd stick with that. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it was interesting because um, in every – you talk about gamers who say, oh, I don't care about story. I just want to play the game. But when a game doesn't do well, what's the one of the first things people point to? The story, the writing. Yeah. And so it seems that it is important just not until it, you know, starts to suck or it does really well. There's no middle ground there, I don't think. It's, it's like the old joke about the offensive lineman in football. You know, no one notices you until you make a mistake. Precisely, precisely. So I'm going to use your excuse, by the way. If this podcast isn't good, it's not my fault. It's because the, the translation of it, <laughs> the, the editing screwed it up. It was actually very good in the rough draft. Yeah, see, so, there you go. It's very convenient. So moving on, people who you mentioned a little bit of Blizzard North. I think people generally know that it started off as Condor, and then they were making Diablo 1, and they got bought by Blizzard. This has been in the Blizzard 20th anniversary specials they've been putting out and such of late. You know, Can you give us kind of a brief, I mean, I guess a brief history as a, is a relative term here, but you know, kind of the milestones for people who haven't followed the company all that well. Can you just rattle them off from all your experience at this point? I can definitely do that. Um, the the founders of Condor, which eventually, of course, as we talked about, became Blizzard North. Um, those being David Brevik and Max and Eric Schaefer, met uh, rather coincidentally. They were all working at a, um, a small startup game company on uh, an Atari Lynx game, and I'm going to have to double check all these facts. Everything's bleeding together at this point, but it's all in the book, of course. We're, this is just your thumbnail be. rundown. Oh, yes. Um, so they were working on that project, and they, they all clicked very well with Eric and Max doing the art and, and Dave writing code. And when they eventually went their separate ways, they, they kind of got in contact and said, hey, you know, none of us happens to be doing anything right now. Why don't we start that company we always talked about? Uh, and that became Condor. They started out, just the three of them, working in an office in Redwood City on 
the Sega Genesis version of Justice League Task Force, which actually kind of came into their into play uh, in the story of how they met the guys from Blizzard Entertainment a little later on. And they were uh, making the same game. They for were making system, the same right? game for for Super NES. And yeah. some, you know, I get conflicting stories on this. As Dave Brevik tells it, he had no idea that they were uh, that, that you know neither company had any uh, any idea that either was working on the game for the opposite system. They met at a CES show, and. Uh, <laughs> and, and they each took a look at the other's game and went, huh, interesting. And so that's kind of how Condor and, and Blizzard struck up a relationship. So um, kind of fast-forwarding a bit, they, Dave Brevik had been entertaining the idea uh, for a game like Diablo. For some years, he was, he was after a game that was kind of a graphical re- rebirth of the text-based uh, roguelikes that he played in college where you, you know, build a character and then just take it down into a dungeon and fight letters <laughs> that represent creatures and troll for treasure and that sort of thing. That became a Diablo, and um, they actually talked to, to Blizzard about it. Blizzard expressed a lot of interest. Um, and Blizzard North built the game with uh, Blizzard... Uh, well, Condor built the game, becoming Blizzard North, once the, uh, the mutual parent company, Davidson & Associates, acquired them and changed their name. Um, and Blizzard Entertainment worked on the, the Battle.net service that course broke a lot of ground for the multiplayer being I think the the first if or one of the first at least um, online services that allowed people to connect with others from around the world and, and play for free as a built-in functionality to the game uh, and then from there they they rolled right into Diablo 2 um, one year after that game's release released uh, Lord of Destruction the expansion pack and then went through a lot of uh, a lot of upheaval, a lot, a lot of tossing and, and turning of uh, ideas over the next couple of years until 2003, when for um, a number of reasons the three founders, along with Bill Roper, left the company. Of course, went on to, to form Flagship, and Blizzard North persisted another two years, working much closer, uh, in some ways, <laughs> with Blizzard Entertainment on Diablo 3 until the decision was made to close the studio's doors in 2005. Yeah, the much closer could be the the subject of much discussion. Not not really by their choice, from what I've been told. <laughs> no, not really by their choice. In fact, it caught um, pretty much everyone off guard. Uh, no one more so than the studio head at that time, Rick Cease. So it was uh, very disappointing. But um, you'll come to find that a lot of people saw it as inevitable. But uh, yeah, that's a matter of perspective, I guess. So one of the topics that's come up a lot is that. People today just look at Blizzard as one large company, and of course that wasn't always the case. It was Blizzard North was up in the San Francisco area, just south of the city in San Mateo, and that's what 300 miles from Irvine. Yeah. And obviously that <laughs> gave them a little bit of separation. Right. And I visited Blizzard North a few times when they were still open, and one of the things the developers talked about was that they liked having some separation. They gave them a little bit of autonomy. They could collaborate with Blizzard Irvine, but they weren't, you know, right in the same room all the time, so it was kind of a fresh look at each other's games. Yes. Some of the Blizzard North guys were pretty proud of the work they had done, suggestions they'd made on games like StarCraft. Starcraft. They were obviously doing lots of testing of that as it was getting close to finished, and they said they, they felt like they had a fresh perspective on it, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And they said they got the same kind of thing from Blizzard Irvine people testing Diablo and Diablo 2. And have you heard stories about that from the guys you've talked to? Yeah, I heard we've we've talked a lot about the um, the interactions and the relationship between uh, the two blizzards, and I think that relationship it plays a very large role um, in in Blizzard North's history, uh, the influence on Diablo, kind of a uh, little bit of pushing and shoving every now and then. But what I really found interesting is that while the relationship was contentious, it was beca- it was contentious because these were people from from two um, two different game companies all very passionate about making good games and making sure the best uh, ideas floated to the top. In fact, uh, Max Schaefer even told me they came to enjoy those arguments <laughs> because even though everyone left uh, quite flustered and sometimes hoarse from shouting, I'm sure, um, you know, you had great decisions that obviously made some of the greatest games ever made. Um, there, and there was a lot of testing back and forth. There were what was called the strike teams, which uh, Blizzard might use today, I'm not really sure, but um, basically a team of, of key decision makers who would extensively play the games and, and work with the developers uh, very closely from any team um, to make sure that, that uh, the design was moving 
in the right direction. And you know, it's it's actually really funny. Uh, a lot of people have mentioned to me, even Blizzard North guys, who when they applied, they did not realize that there were two Blizzards. They just figured they would be working on Blizzard. I think a lot of them started expecting to work on a, a craft game, you know, Warcraft or Starcraft, and ended up working on Diablo, which they actually came to prefer because, of course, you know, uh, for the character artists, uh, for example, they loved the, the monsters in the, in the world design of Diablo, so it was a real pleasure for them to work on that. We should probably mention briefly that Max Schaefer just plain enjoys arguments, so that's not, yes. <laughs> that may just be and his personality is, yeah. instead of the, the development strength. Yes, uh, I've heard many stories of uh, the Condor crew and their and their first couple offices is very small where Max and Eric and, and their friend uh, Ken Williams, who of course joined the company um, in a managerial role, uh, they they like to spend a good part of their morning shouting back and forth from their offices, not not going to each other's rooms to have a a face to face inside voice conversation, just shouting back and forth. It was kind of their warm up, I guess. And the, the odd part of that is that Ken is a very small guy. <laughs> he and, is. And yes. a very, you know, very nice guy. I mean, I've, I've talked to him a number of times at Blizzard. And yet both the Schaefers are, what, 6'3", six, 6'4", six, big, big barrel-chested guys. guys. Yes. Max is, Max is built for shouting, in other words. <laughs> yes, all, all very passionate about their projects and um, politics, all sorts of things. Get them started, and uh, that passion will come out, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, briefly, before we get into a little more of the um, Blizzard North function, did you ever see or hear details about their other secret project they were working on in 2003? Yes. And Is that there secret was... for the book stuff, or do you have any details about that you can give out? I'm going to save most of it for the book stuff, but there were actually... That was um, a very experimental time for the company. There was a, a secret project in the work, and that that project actually changed directions. I don't even think anyone has a concrete count. I think I've counted seven or eight different directions over the course of those two years. But there and this were, was this was not Diablo three. That this was, was not Diablo on two III. projects at the time, and that was the second one. Correct. This project was developed uh, parallel to Diablo three, but they were separate. And, and there's uh, never been any name, any any images, any word of it officially released of any kind. Right. It was referred to internally as Project X. And the reason for that was not only because initially the design was unknown, but it changed so often that no one really got attached to any particular name other than Project X. Um, there are also some other cool things uh, in development that I can tell you about. One thing of particular interest was um, Blizzard North... Uh, and, and Blizzard as a whole, I'm sure, um, entered into a relationship with Capcom to develop a Diablo game for consoles. Not not a port of Diablo 2 like EA did for the original Diablo on PlayStation 1, but a unique Diablo game set uh, in a far east on a Far East continent in Sanctuary. And it would incorporate um, all sorts of Eastern themes, character designs... And uh, the relationship fell through, but it sounded like something that would have definitely been a lot of fun to play. It was intended for PS2, so I'm sure it would have done very well. And you have a, a time frame on that? That was like after Diablo 2? That was that was after Diablo 2. That was one of the many projects in development um, over the course of 2001 and 2003. I think huh, that was that was definitely a little later on. I think that was before uh, the founders left the company in 2003. And speaking of the founders leaving, something interesting we found out earlier this year when I was interviewing Max Schaefer on this very podcast is he said that the early design of Diablo 3 was as an MMO. That is correct. And from what Max said, he left, as you said, in, in 2003. It was set kind of in the, I think he said he turned it the Irish countryside, which I guess is kind of Tristram-esque looking. Yeah. You and know, the, oh, go ahead. So it seems like it was kind of the same concept, but many more people in the game. And obviously it was very early in the project still. Yeah, you know, they were still in a very, um, you know, Blizzard North had a style of, of iterating on their games. They would kind of take a core idea, get something on screen, see how it played, and then tear it down or build it, tweak it, what have you, from there, and just kind of flesh it out and, and see how it growed. And uh, and that was very, very much the case with Diablo 3. Um, it was going to take an MMO direction, but as to what that was in particular... A lot of people weren't quite sure because by the time they left, they had just gotten some on-screen things going. They were running around killing some monsters, but you know, in terms of the size of the world, its persistence, how inst instances would come into play, a lot of that stuff was still being uh, discussed and worked out. 
You mentioned that Kelly Johnson was one of your early contacts. He was mm-hmm. an artist at Blizzard North, and yes. he basically designed the Paladin and the Fetish Monsters and some other major game things. Yes. And he has a blog, which had some interesting posts a couple of years ago, which were kind of embittered, I think you could, you could safely call them. Yes. <laughs> and basically said that in the early, you know, 2000 to 2003, he thought that the company was lacking direction, that the founders were worried about money and not really working on a new game very much, and that they kind of left in 2003 because they didn't like how Diablo 3 was going and they took the opportunity to, to bail out. I mean, I may be mischaracterizing his words. I will link to that in the post, but do you have any uh, feedback on that concept? Um, you know, I think one thing you'll find... Uh, that makes this story so interesting is um, because Blizzard North and Blizzard were such open, organic, egalitarian companies that um, almost every perspective can tell the same story a little differently. And so Kelly's perspective is one that was actually it was echoed by a fair amount of people, including Dave Max and Eric themselves. Um, the, uh, there were a number of reasons that led to the kind of the dysfunctionality of that time and also the I mean, it was also very experimental as I said and uh, it generated a lot of interesting ideas but I can say that one factor that certainly contributed to um, if you want to call it a lack of traction was just that you know Diablo 2 a lot of those guys crunched for 18 months solid we're talking <laughs> seven days a week 12 to 14 hour days for over a year and a half and so a lot of people Never, they never really recovered from that, and I mean, they that they told me that themselves. They kind of still feel it a little bit whenever a game project ramps up. There's this kind of clenching of the gut, <laughs> and uh, and so yeah, Kelly's perspective is one on that that was echoed by a fair amount of people around that time. I should mention that I did send that link to Max when I talked to him earlier this year, and he looked it over and said, "I can understand why he feels that way, but I think it's bullshit." Basically, you know, you know, Max is not for, for shy about using words of that right. nature. <laughs> so he's, he basically said, I can understand his perspective, but I don't agree with it. So, as you say, there's different perspectives on things from different people's points of view. Totally. For a story like this, you don't want to just talk to one, two, or, of course, in the case of the three founders, three people. I wanted to talk to as many people as possible to get as much information as possible. And uh, the thing about some of those perspectives is some are right, some are wrong, some are a little right, some are a little a little wrong. And so I think that's one of the interesting things that um, that readers will enjoy about this book, getting so many perspectives and seeing, oh, okay, so this is how so-and-so seated. I'm, uh, you know, saw things. Um, I'm writing the book in a, in a style that will allow everyone to, to really get to know the people who played such important roles on, on Diablo and Diablo 2's development and other projects. And um, it's funny, too, because um, Dave, Max, and Eric themselves, you know, as well as, well as uh, a number of their former colleagues have said, one thing they're enjoying, uh, or um, I should say anticipating about the book, is just, you know, getting to know what everyone else is really thinking around that time. Um, the, st- the studio has been closed for a little over six years now. Some people left even before that, and so I think everyone's had a lot of time to really think about things. So, you know, a lot of the opinions and perspectives you'll read are kind of a hindsight is 2020. Here's what I thought then. Here's how I see it now, which is very interesting. And how are you formatting the book? And in terms of, is it chronological and you have lots of different versions of events or are you following individual narratives from people for longer times? It's a little bit of, of all of those things. It will be a creative nonfiction book with a core narrative. I will follow... Uh, different people, different characters, if you will, through different time periods. But I'm also um, going to be inserting a lot of quotes that will give readers the opportunity to hear directly from the developers. Because my stance is, you know, this isn't my story. I'm just the guy who decided to start pestering people until they talk to me about it. You know, I'm just the guy. I'm just the mouthpiece. And so, um, you know, kind of intertwined with that core narrative, you'll get a lot of quotes. And, and so... Uh, Get a lot of um, very personal insight into into all sorts of things. There, the book will offer something for everyone. At least that's my intention. You'll have, um, you know, the core story, you know, the drama, if you will, of of the day to day life there. But you'll also have for people in the industry or just interested in how games are made. I'm going to get into the a lot of the the nitty gritty of how Diablo and Diablo 2 were made. But I'm formatting in such a way so that if you don't really care about that and you don't want to interrupt the story, you can just skip over those little sections and, and keep trucking along with the, uh, the characters, as we'll call them. Do you have any visuals in the book, or is it purely text? 
I will be including a lot of candid photos that uh, a number of Blizzard North employees have generously donated to me and that I still have to get back to them, actually. You kind of reminded me <laughs> about that. Um, so we'll, we'll have a lot of candid shots. Um, no, no in-game assets or anything of that nature because while I did talk to Blizzard North about participating, they in the end decided not to. Uh, but wished me well with the project. But, you know, without their participation, that means no in-game screenshots. But I really don't think that sort of thing will enhance the book uh, to any degree anyway. I think the uh, the words will definitely um, do a good job of telling the story. And also, you know, the candid shots will, I think, will give people um, a chance to see what they want to see. Anyone can look up Diablo screenshots or boot up the games and take a look at them. You'll get to see, you'll get to put uh, names to faces with these pictures. Did you? We got the leaked screenshots of earlier this year on Kotaku, mm -hmm. which were ones from fairly late in the project, from 05, I was told, and right. you know, kind of showing Diablo in hell, basically. Mm -hmm. And that was a direction the project took after the big four left, and you know, lots of other people left as well. Apparently, that was what the uh, the Rick Size version of it was, as far as you know. Uh, yes, actually, those I've talked to a number of uh, guys about those screenshots, and they are they are from the Blizzard North version of Diablo 2 that was in production in 2005. Yeah, I talked to um, Ben Booz, actually, who's, mm -hmm. who's tragically passed away this year, actually. We had long planned to have a big interview about the old days and kind of the stuff you're doing in this book. Mm -hmm. And then I found out some months later he had some sort of accident and died this year. It was really, really sad. He had two really great books he'd put out. But anyway, he said that one of the last things he did at Blizzard North in 04, before he left to go to Flagship briefly, was the interface that was visible in those screenshots. You know, kind of the angel and the demon around the health globes, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he thought it was weird to see that showing up four years later, so... Yeah, you know, who? it's actually funny, um, you know, Ben's passing was, was, a very, was a very sad thing. I didn't get to know him for long, but he was... You could tell he was a great guy, and he was such a talented artist. There's so many stories I've heard about guys who, when they were you know, waiting for uh, art to render or builds to, to download, they would just go into Ben's office and just watch him draw. I mean, he was, he was that captivating in his work. And uh, I, think, I think it was Ben who said to me, he was like, you know, I'm glad you called me for these interviews because I was wondering about those screenshots. Was that you? And I said, no, actually, I haven't gotten <laughs> any of those assets. From anyone, I was surprised to surprised to see them as anyone else. So it was a pretty cool thing to get a look at the game. To get into a little bit of a uh, of scandalous rumor mongering, mm -hmm. which is uh, I think kind of a subtext here. There were lots of stories about the Big Four leaving. The Big Four being the two Schaefer brothers and Dave Brevik and Bill Roper, as you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And that was in I think May of 2003 and came as a very big shock to everyone outside of the area who didn't know they were having any difficulties and thought of these guys as being very integral parts of Blizzard and the Diablo series. And at the time, the official explanation that Bill and others gave, and they did numerous interviews afterwards, was basically that there was a lot of instability in the company. It was, it was being sold at the time. I believe by, by Vivendi was trying to find a buyer and wasn't having any luck with it. Mm. And they were getting, they, the, the big four said they weren't getting any feedback about that, any information. There'd recently been a big financial scandal with the stock value had depreciated quite a bit because of some shenanigans in the, I guess, the European offices. And they just kind of said they weren't getting any feedback and weren't getting any communication and said they, they went to the point of offering their resignations if they didn't get any information. And they didn't get information, so they quit. And is that more or less the version you were told while pursuing this? Yes, that is. That, that is very accurate. Um, you know, it was a case of uh, I would ask people about the parent companies, interacting with the parent companies, hearing about, you know, Blizzard and Blizzard North possibly being up for sale. And it was actually kind of a game. We would see who could recount the exact order of Blizzard's parent companies, beginning with Davidson and going forward all the way <laughs> to Vivendi. And a lot of people had trouble doing it. It changed hands so many times. And, you know, one problem a lot of the big four had with that was, you know, you don't want to find out that your company is possibly up for sale by logging into Yahoo and seeing it on the front page of the news. You know, you, you, you kind of want some insider information on this. You kind of want some input. Um, and so, uh, we'll, you know, the book will get into, you know, the full details, but that's pretty much what happened. They asked for, um, they didn't even ask for anything, really. They said, you know, we would just like to be kept in the loop. Can we, uh, you know, we just want to talk. Can we at least talk? 
and they they tendered their resignations to to uh, to make sure that everyone knew they were, you know, for real. And their resignations were accepted, and they were as surprised by that as anyone who read the headline about the founders leaving the company. And nothing in this description that they've mentioned ever talked about what Blizzard Irvine was doing or what they were being told by Blizzard Irvine. It was always like, we're going directly to our ownership in France. Do you know why there was not collaboration or communication with Irvine, or is that being left out of the story somehow? Um, you know, there are bits and pieces, uh, pieces of that that will be in the story. There was collaboration, actually. Um, from my understanding, uh, Blizzard was as frustrated by that as Blizzard North. You know, they were... Um, it's always something interesting. I mean, Blizzard holds a lot of power today uh, to make their own decisions, to follow their own you know, creative pursuits. But, um, you know, for a long time, they were just one company in a portfolio filled with companies. And so there was a lot of turbulence that they had... Uh, no say in themselves. So I will touch on that a bit, but most of the perspective from that time comes from the Blizzard North crew. And, uh, of course, from there, we see how uh, Blizzard Entertainment handled the departure of those guys and uh, having a bigger say on Diablo 3 going forward from there. Just a brief interjection. One of the great ironies is that I don't remember the sales sales price they were off asking, but it was in a few a few hundred million dollars, I recall. 300, 400, 500 million, something like that. Yeah, something, yeah. And then, of course, this is in 2003, and World of Warcraft comes out two years later and starts making that much every year just in revenues from right. these subscriptions. So whoever, if no, as they're called, nobody actually bought it, right? They ended up selling part of it to another company, and it's still largely owned by Vivendi. And if, if some brilliant billionaire had swept in and offered, you know, could have had Blizzard <laughs> lock, stock, and barrel for... You know what it what it earns in three months of World of Warcraft. You know, two years later, it seemed like it would a fantastic available bargain there that no one took. Yeah, you have it, to think Vivendi's pretty happy nobody ever actually bought the company, <laughs> given what they've done since then. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because um, when Vivendi would try to to um, sell Blizzard, a lot of people backed out of buying it. You know, Microsoft was a rumor for a while um, because. You know, people wanted just Blizzard, but Vivendi was a little smarter than that. They also tried to jettison Sierra and certain other companies that weren't doing so well. So it was a package deal. They had to take Blizzard and everything, not just Blizzard. And that's probably why a lot of people were kicking themselves, wishing they would have just, you know, taken the money makers with the chaff and, and waited for things to play out for World of Warcraft later yeah, on. Yeah, it wasn't much of a wait. <laughs> no, it was not. I mentioned earlier rumor monger. I didn't quite get into that, but there were a lot of rumors flying around about the big four leaving, and you can either no comment or shoot these down or whatever you'd like. Mm -hmm. I, I went and dug a few up from the time and from my own my own memory, which is probably erroneous. <laughs> One of the big things was that the early development of Diablo 3, this is a rumor, obviously, the, the early development was not going to Blizzard Irvine's liking, and it wasn't making much progress. And they were saying, you should be doing X and Y and Z instead of what you're doing, and the the guys got up, up ha unhappy about the interference and said, "The hell with this, we're leaving." Uh, that is something I've talked to them about, but they stick to their story about you know a lot of uh, fluctuation with parent companies and a lot of just fog covering up things that they wanted to see. So uh, we'll see if more of those details come out. But for now, that's all I can really say about it. Another rumor at the time was that they wanted to make Diablo 3 a massively multiplayer game and that Blizzard Irvine wouldn't allow that because they had all this World of Warcraft planning underway. That's become a little more ironic since Max has actually said they were making it as an MMO. <laughs> and, but at the time, that was one of the hot rumors. You hear any, I, I don't even know if we can classify that now given the additional information that's come out since then. Sure, you know, and that's where the perspectives come into play. There were some people who believed that Blizzard did have a problem with working on uh, two MMOs at once, and then there were other people who, you know, Diablo 3 was going to be an MMO, yes, but the intention that was almost unanimous from what I've heard was that while it would be an MMO, it would still incorporate the same style of gameplay as seen in Diablo 1 and 2, so, you know, there wouldn't be a lot of uh, overlap there to take players from one game or the other. That's actually something I'm looking to talk to Max about. And ask him, you know, how would they have made an action RPG like Diablo 2 work with, you know, 64 people on the same screen or something like that? It seems, you know, I mean, you know, they, that's one of the big points of Diablo 3 is they're only having four people in a game because they say it's too crowded with even six or eight, like we saw in Diablo 2. Right. And how could you make that style of rapid killing, killing hundreds of monsters very quickly 
work for, you know, 50 people. Yeah, you know, and I mean, that's something we talked a bit about. But I think, again, they were just they were just in the stage where they were getting things on screen, running around, you know, testing some levels, killing some monsters. And that's kind of how Blizzard North worked. They would start small and just kind of, you know, they have that one core idea, the whole of the donut, if you will. And then they would kind of build build around it. So maybe they had thought more about how to handle an issue like that, especially back then when broadband wasn't exactly ubiquitous in households. But maybe it wasn't something they'd really... Um, you know, kind of figured out yet. All of this does does point to one issue is that this is in this is happening in, in early and mid two thousand and three, which is three years after Diablo two and two years after the expansion, mm-hmm. and they're still basically on the drawing board with the sequel. So you could see there could be some some tensions here saying, Hey, is this game ever going to get finished? What have you guys been doing for the last two and a half years? Sure. I mean you could say that you know I mean that's the one thing um this book really, you know, We'll touch on the rumor mongering and, and the scandals, as you put it earlier, although that's not the main focus. But there was definitely a lot. There was kind of a lot of unrest during that period. A lot of people wondering, you know, where the company was going, when things were going to get rolling. And um, I think that the part that a lot of people should remember is that, um, although there are more factors that played into it, that's just how a lot of Blizzard worked. Um, they would take some time to really, you know, toss around ideas, get something going, and then really take their time. Uh, and building an idea, getting that up rather quickly, but then refining, refining, refining. And, uh, I mean, yeah, there there was some, some unrest around that time simply because, to a lot, in a lot of people's opinion, things weren't moving as a pace as they would like. One other brief thing about the Big Four leaving is after they left, they talked a lot about how they didn't like having all of the administration work. They'd kind of become CEOs of this major company, which had two development teams working and they didn't want to keep doing, you know, administrative stuff. They didn't want to about, worry about hiring and firing and, you know, office supplies and such. They just wanted to make games. Right. And so, of course, then they formed Flagship, which instantly blew up into two studios and inventing their whole new, their uh, Ping Zero was their online access and stuff. And they said this has kind of happened again. And Max seems a little bit, Max and Eric, I think, are a lot happier now at, at Runic to some extent with, you know, 20 people on their team and just making games. Yeah, you know, I think that's something that um, that those, you know, Dave, Max, and Eric all agreed on, and that readers will come to see in the book. I think that those three guys were much happier um, making games, you know, in a smaller, more intimate setting with a, you know, a, a 15 to 20 to maybe 30 person team at max, rather than you know having studios just kind of blow up because they've all kind of you know echoed that sentiment of that they weren't necessarily making games. Um, they weren't in the they weren't in this in- industry to, to make their own companies to own their own companies. They just wanted to make games, and the management uh, side of that equation was an unfortunate means to an end to deal with. So getting back to the the smaller smaller company sizes, more intimate teams and settings, I think is definitely something that's uh, Max and Eric certainly have expressed uh, happiness over. The problem with that is that they had a, a management team at Blizzard Irvine that could have that would apparently have been quite happy to run everything they were doing, but they weren't willing to cede that control and lose their autonomy, mm-hmm. and yet they weren't happy having to make all the all the leading decisions that were required by having autonomy. Yes, there is kind of a kind of a conflict there. I mean, that was that was one thing that the you know the big three. And then uh, later on, of course, Bill Roper were very were very insistent on they wanted their autonomy. So you know, it's it's kind of like you know when you grow up, you still you don't want your parents making all those decisions. Not that Blizzard South was really apparent a to Blizzard North, but you know, you want to make all those decisions yourself. You want to have the autonomy to, you know, to succeed or fail on your own terms, rather than someone butting in and kind of just saying no, do this, do that, do that. So you know whether that worked out for better or worse. Uh, we'll see. And that segues nicely into the issue of what happened after they left, where they had been able to preserve this autonomy because they had a lot of power as the founders of the company. I guess either institutional strength or just kind of personal. You know, Max would shout at people, <laughs> as you said. And then once they were gone, and then Blizzard North was restructured, they canceled or at least backburnered the other project, the Project X. And everybody was concentrated on just Diablo three, mm-hmm. and then Blizzard Irvine became much more involved. Yes, and and that's a section I would really like to leave largely uh, untold until the book comes out. But um, it, you know, it is true that you know Dave Max and Eric founded the company, and they were the ones who 
um, kind of made sure that it was you know their decision to go forward with everything, and every decision made on a project was theirs. And without them there, um, Blizzard did have more control. And that wasn't necessarily a bad thing, but in some cases it wasn't really a good thing because both companies were kind of learning a new relationship. You know, here are these guys that uh, that really, you know, uh, that the big three really didn't let through very often before just because they wanted to be in control of their own projects and now how do, how do we work with this? How, you know, who's, whose game is this? Rick Seas, for example. A lot of times he really didn't know how to refer to himself. Was he a studio lead? Was he the Blizzard North manager? You know, it was a very, very different position for everyone involved, and that that carried over to Diablo three. You know, whose whose decision should we go with in any given case? Is this Blizzard North's call? Do we need to run it by Blizzard? You know, we'll explore a lot of that in the book. Yeah, I'll save the uh, stories that I've heard from, in, in deference to it being in your book, but they were not happy stories. The ones <laughs> from people <laughs> who were still there, very uh, annoyed by interferences and and management is what basically I was told. So it'd be good if you had some different perspectives on that. Yeah, there's certainly um, some of that. Certainly, again, the perspectives come into play. And I think that was kind of the overall consensus. But, you know, it just had to do with, I mean, there were a lot of factors coming into play at that time. A company stabilization was an issue, right? After, after the big four left, uh, a round of layoffs followed, which saw a third of the company let go. So here you have, after this traumatic event, everyone's supposed to come back to work and, okay, make the hit game that we expect to see from you. And that's not an easy thing to do. And, of course, after that, you know, you had, you had uh, some ex-Blizzard North guys who let go in those layoffs, creating Castaway, so they were attracting some, some Blizzard North names. You had people occasionally leaving for flagship. You had the, the new Blizzard North and Blizzard Entertainment relationship to, to deal with. It was... It was still a very unsettling time for people just because, you know, it felt like an earthquake and, and the aftershocks were still kind of rolling through. You said you don't have uh, artwork or game assets in your book. I would assume that would be copyright issues as well. I mean, they're owned by Blizzard Entertainment, and unless they give you permission, you couldn't post it. But exactly. we did see those leaked screenshots on Kotaku, and there have been some other monsters and such that have come out from individuals who worked on the project. Did you get to see stuff? Have you seen early versions of the game that were hush hush secret secret on people's <laughs> computers that you can never show the light of day? I'll say that I have um, a lot of assets that I can't release. <laughs> They've just been kind of instrumental in helping with my research and just taking a look and, and seeing how things uh, were progressing. It's really interesting right now. Um, I have not actually played the Diablo 3 beta yet, but I've been following coverage and, and walked through videos and. Um, you know, just in a lot of the, in speaking of lore and gameplay features, it's interesting to see a lot of things that actually uh, existed in Blizzard North's version, but were um, either kind of re redrawn or um, just kind of retooled for Blizzard Entertainment's take on the game. So it's been really interesting to see that. Yeah, that would be a, obviously that would be a nice feature in your book if you could I put some of that stuff in, but I, there's probably legal issues as well. Yes, many. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have connect contacts with anyone currently working on Diablo 3 or at Blizzard Irvine for this project? Uh, no comment. They're generally known for being not very co cooperative to outside media access. No, and, you know, actually, I mean, I can say that uh, my conversations with them, I spoke to the head of their PR department, and they were very pleasant, but they were also, they also explained to me that, you know... They say no very nicely, yes. They say no very nicely. They explained that... Actually, this is something that um, the Blizzard founders, uh, you know, Frank Pierce, Mike Morheim, and, and Alan Adham uh, discussed. They said, you know, if we ever get really big, you know, I'm sure there'll be offers for, you know, behind the scenes and tell-alls, and that's just something we shouldn't participate in for a number of reasons. And so they explained that to me. But they did wish me well. So um, they said no nicely. <laughs> yeah, I, I know other people who have attempted to do projects that it would involve some input from Blizzard. You know, not not the kind of thing you're doing exactly, but... Right. Just the PR is very much a stone wall, and they really are uh, monolithic in their, their corporate nature at this point in time. Sure, and and it's I mean it's not really hard to understand why. Like I I, I understood their polite way of saying no, as soon as they said it, and kind of anticipated it. I mean when you're when you're that that renowned, you're going to have all sorts of people coming to you with all these you know supposed offers. Hey, I'm writing a book. I'm making a documentary. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. You can't possibly do all of them, and, and probably a lot of them would never pan out anyway. So their position makes sense. 
that is, though, one of the major differences between how Blizzard North was run, where they were much more open. They, you know, the developers routinely posted on game on forums. I mean, that's how I was first invited there as our website because they used to come in our in our chat room. You know, we'd have Max Schaefer in our in our old IRC chat room arguing about items for an hour with <laughs> random fans. Yes. And you yes. don't you don't exactly see that these days from Blizzard, partially because they're just much bigger, but they're much more controlling in their in their message. Yeah. Um... That was that was a big difference. I actually got a chance to go to Blizzard North um, shortly after I graduated from high school. It was about a week before Diablo II went gold, so you can imagine that uh, the mood in the office kind of oscillated between you know a calm and frantically making sure everything was was glued together properly. And you know everyone was so so inviting there. In fact, I remember meeting Rick, and you know they took me over to a Japanese import PlayStation Two they had because it wasn't out in the states yet. And he sat down with me and showed me some games. I went into John Moran's office and he spawned Diablo <laughs> right in the middle of the Rogue encampment and, and you know fought him there for me and it was it was cool to see. So they were very open and I mean you're absolutely right. Um, there's a big difference in just kind of the culture and the approach that the two Blizzards took and that Blizzard continues to take. And uh, that that's one of the core themes of my book. The reason I I wanted to talk to so many people formerly from Blizzard Entertainment, kind of you know skirting around the uh, electric fence there was to, to really compare and contrast the two cultures and see how... I mean, they initially grew in parallel. They were very, very similar, but there was a, you know, a point where they kind of diverged, and I wanted to explore that because I think it, it has a lot of bearing on, uh, on what happened to Blizzard North in its last couple of years there. Anything else in the book besides the Blizzard North stories? Have you got projections for future things or no, I really personal, personal informations or any other things people wouldn't expect from your description? Um, no, you know, it's really that uh, my focus is, um, first of all, I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of the, the rumor mongering and the, you know, the periods of unrest, but really this is a very, this is a very fun story about how a company that, you know, came together to create a game and create a culture that, that, that made a game that, uh, that's still on the shelf 11 years later. I mean, uh, how many games and, and systems and technologies has, has Diablo 2 seen come and go? And I think that's really the core of the book. It's it's about the culture of the company and the people who who had uh, such such monumental input in the game. Everyone was invited to uh, to weigh in on the game and help with its design. And I think that's that's what will make the story a very personal and intimate account of of the company's history. And again, another reason why I kind of took a creative nonfiction book meets documentary approach in making sure to you know, step back occasionally and let the guys and the gals, in some cases, have their say as to you know how things played out from their perspective. And this book is coming out very soon, and people can buy it at bookstores everywhere, or not? Well, not very soon. The reason I'm actually <coughs> starting to advertise this so early is because it just seems like the right time. As soon as the Diablo 3 beta news started springing up, I thought, you know... This is kind of the time when all eyes will be on Diablo News, and it seems the appropriate time to make people aware of the book's existence and, and that it's coming. Uh, I'm aiming for a next summer, early or late, but, but sometime next summer. And uh, it will actually be first uh, released as an ebook. I'm actually starting, this is something I've worked on for a number of years, I'm starting my own uh, ebook publishing company dedicated to books of this nature, books that explore the video game industry, titles, developers, and culture, and this will be our uh, our debut title. There is another one in the works after this, but that, that gets a no comment, but I think that uh, this is a great way to start because it's a, it's a project I've had a lot of passion and love for over the years, so I think that when it does come out next summer, I think people will enjoy it very much. And we will speak again, I guess, next summer at some point, when closer to the book as you get your publicity more up and running. Absolutely. And I was going to say, do you have any other projects in mind? What's next for you? But you're still kind of working on this, and you just said no comment on the next project. <laughs> right. As far as uh, the uh, the publishing company goes, that's Digital Monument Press. Um, readers can check that out, or your listeners, I guess, in this case. Uh, DM-Press.com will be up and running uh, next Monday for Halloween, a very apropos date to, uh, to release information on the Diablo book, I think. And we're recording this on um, October 27th with a goal of posting it on Monday, which will be, I guess, the day your site goes live, and we'll have links to that, and people can check it out. Yes. Even as they listen. Exactly. 
That is okay, I, th- I think that's it. Any other topic, anything else you wanted to say before we're done? Um, just that I'm, I'm glad we got a chance to talk. I was a big fan of yours from your DiabloII.net days. It was my homepage <laughs> for a long time. So, it's again, it's just, you know, these, uh, these names and personalities that I knew only as, you know, names in a manual or on a screen, getting to work with them in various ways has been a lot of fun. So I thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, it's that we were your gateway drug. <laughs> exactly, exactly. The Daily Tip, yeah, Naked Babe Stories, all of it, yes. Yeah, it's been it's been fun. It was obviously a lot more fun and very easy to run the website back in those days when nice. you know I get to send an email to Bill Roper or whoever. Right. It's a little it's a little different these days having to try to do everything through PR with you know all their rules and regulations. But ah, the good old days, yes. or perhaps not. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for your time, Mr. Craddock. Thank you very much. And we will have details about this coming up when this is posted. Excellent. And and you've been listening to the Diablo Podcast, and we are online at DiabloPodcast.com.